Welcome to Usability and Human Factors, Usability Evaluation Methods. This is Lecture A. In this lecture, we are going to talk about a range of usability evaluation methods, including interviews, surveys, and focus groups. We will also explore usability inspection methods, in particular the heuristic evaluation method. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to 1. Describe the importance of usability in relation to health information technologies. 2. List and describe usability evaluation methods. 3. When confronted with a particular situation and set of goals, determine which usability evaluation method would be most appropriate and effective. We've introduced and discussed the concept of, of usability in various lectures. It reflects the quality of a user's experience when interacting with a product or system. Does the system enhance or impede the user's experience? There are a wide range of factors that influence the user's experience, and this is just a partial subset. This list covers different dimensions of experience. Most health technologies will involve some sort of learning curve, and some systems are better at providing resources for learning than others. This is what we refer to as the learnability of the system. Clinical information systems can more or less effectively support cognitive tasks, such as finding the patient's glucose values from last month. A certain number of errors in task performance are inevitable. But an unintuitive system that imposes a high memory load on users is likely to increase the rate of errors. Aesthetics and subjective satisfaction are very personal dimensions, but then again, we are talking about a user's experience, which is inherently subjective. We've already made the case for usability evaluation, but there is certainly still one to be made on both the clinical side and on the patient side. In their review of the literature, Kaplan and Harris Salamon state, quote, Despite an accumulation of best practices research identifying success factors, IT implementation projects are often not successful. Across industry sectors, at least 40% of such generic IT projects either are abandoned or fail to meet business requirements, while fewer than 40% of large systems purchased from vendors meet their goals. Some sources report 70% failure rates." End quote. The Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, which is better known as HIMSS, considers poor usability of clinical information systems as possibly the single most important factor hindering adoption. Usability problems are not only associated with poor system adoption, but a lack of efficiency and productivity, and even problems associated with patient safety and medical errors. One may expect that clinical information systems that are difficult to use would be associated with user fatigue, frustration, and higher error rates. This is known to be the case. There is a similar story to be told in terms of patients and health consumers. There are a growing number of high-quality e-health interventions, and they offer significant promise to bridge the digital divide, to reach out to users who are normally disenfranchised by such systems. However, Problems associated with usability and inadequate design are likely to present significant problems for this population. These problems disproportionately affect lower computer literacy users. Similarly, patients suffering from chronic illness and older adults have special needs, and these patients are also more susceptible to usability problems. The net effect of such interventions could be to further exacerbate the digital divide and possibly even increase health disparities. That would be a very unfortunate and ironic turn of events. The National Center for Cognitive Informatics and Decision Making in Healthcare states that evaluation is a critical element in the success of any project, both for developers and buyers. According to the center, quote, Developers need formative evaluation, quick feedback for making mid-project corrections, or for improving the next version. Formative evaluation answers vital questions like, does this part work? Is this process too complicated? On the other hand, both buyers and developers are interested in summative evaluation, an assessment of a system's overall effectiveness, which could help predict how a system would fit into a specific clinic's unique workflow, end quote. The center further states, quote, an evaluation should answer questions and reduce uncertainty. It's easy to answer questions about the concrete items, feature set, system compatibilities, 
cost, and so forth, hard facts that should be readily available. But how do you evaluate something so important, yet seemingly so hard to define, as usability? End quote. The remainder of this lecture will discuss methods for evaluating usability. We will review a few of these different usability evaluation methods. Ethnographic observations refer to us observing users in the real world as they perform computing tasks. Controlled cognitive experiments may be employed to investigate how a given system impacts or transforms human performance. These are conducted in laboratory settings. This is another way to represent usability evaluation methods. It is convenient to think of five superordinate classes or types of methods, and they can be further subdivided into a range of methods. We are going to talk about the first four classes of methods, namely interviews, questionnaires, usability inspection, and usability testing. Let's look at interviews first. Interviews can be grouped into four main types. Unstructured interviews are the most useful early on in the design cycle where you have many degrees of freedom and still trying to understand the user requirements. It is less of a usability evaluation and more of a method that is better suited for requirements engineering. Structured interviews are similar in structure to questionnaires or surveys. You would approach the interview with a very specific agenda and a set of predetermined questions. The interviewer would ask closed questions that present the interviewee with a very small set of response alternatives. The method is most useful when goals are clearly understood. Semi-structured interviews are the third type of interview we will look at. Semi-structured interviews are probably the most widely used interviewed method and the most useful. They enable one to collect data that will answer specific questions, but also allow sufficient latitude to explore new ideas and allow the interviewee to voice their thoughts on a wider range of issues. Finally, the fourth type of interview is focus groups or group interviews. These are different from other interviews in important respects. It can be debated whether it's appropriate to categorize these as interviews, but really it comes down to convenience and economy of groupings. We'll return to focus groups shortly. Most, if not all, interviews are audio recorded and are often transcribed. It's useful to structure an interview into phases. The first part is an introductory phase that is followed by a warm-up session in which relatively simple questions are asked. This may include demographic information. The bulk of the interview, or the main session, consists of a set of questions that are presented in a logical sequence. If the interview is semi-structured, you would normally ask the pre-planned questions first to make sure that they are properly covered, and then leave some time for more probing and exploratory questions. It is a good idea to wind down the interview and clearly signal to the person being interviewed that the interview will soon be ending. This was a usability study of older adults using a telemedicine system. I refers to the, inter to the interviewer and P refers to the patient. It's a useful convention to divide a pa page into two columns with a verbatim transcript on the left-hand side and notes or observations on the right-hand side of the page. It's also a good idea to timestamp a transcript, not in evidence on this transcript. That simply means that you note the elapsed time every 30 seconds or so. It serves to index the recording and also gives structure to the transcript. Focus groups are a method that continues to grow in popularity. The method is commonly used in marketing and social science research. A focus group consists of three to ten participants and a trained facilitator. The participants should be representative of the population in question. For example, if you plan to introduce a new clinical system that will be used by various physicians, nurses, and other hospital personnel, then an effort should be made to include representatives of each of these groups. In terms of topics, focus groups tend to resemble a semi-structured interview in that they are driven by an agenda, but allow sufficient flexibility for people to express themselves. It's important that the facilitator not lose sight of the agenda, as tends to happen from time to time. It is also important to solicit contributions from everyone, including those who are more reluctant to speak up. It may happen that one or two verbose and highly opinionated individuals come to dominate the conversation in a focus group. 
Loud, boisterous, or strongly opinionated participants may serve to suppress participation as others may be reluctant to challenge him or her. The role of the facilitator is to see that the discussion is balanced and that multiple voices are heard. Questionnaires or surveys are a common method for collecting user demographic data and soliciting opinions. The great advantage is that you can reach a relatively large group of people and ask very specific questions. Questions are typically closed-ended with specific choices, although open comments may be solicited. Likert items are a useful way to measure opinions, attitudes, and beliefs on a continuum. The scale is often five or seven, seven points, but nine is not unheard of either. They are often used for evaluating user satisfaction. The statement represents a range of opinions. The expectation is that you rate your agreement with a statement such as, I found the system to be easy to use, on a continuum from one extreme, e.g. highest or strongest agreement, to another, lowest or strongest disagreement. This is a simple illustration of usability Likert questions. Responses are represented on a five-point scale with every point having a verbal label as a value attached to them. Semantic differential rating scales are an alternative to Likert questions. It is convenient and effective only when a question can be expressed in terms of antonym or polar opposites. Semantic differential ratings are less common than Likert questions. Online surveys are fast and convenient ways to reach a large base of people. They fall into two categories, web-based and email-based. Increasingly, web-based is the most popular. These systems afford a range of interactivity which gives you more flexibility in how you ask your questions. Email-based surveys are more or less electronic versions of paper surveys and one's options are rather limited. Another huge advantage of web-based surveys is that the responses are written to a database. This makes it very easy to collect and analyze your data. SurveyMonkey is one of the most popular sites. It enables you to create and publish online surveys in a short period of time and view results graphically and in real time. The image on the slide illustrates the different ways in which questions can be constructed. It shows two kinds of interactivity. The check boxes in question two allow one to make multiple selections and radio buttons in questions three and four force the user to select a single response. You can custom tailor the surveys using logic and conditional branching. For example, you may choose to present users who have experience using a particular health website with a different question set than those who are relatively new to the site. We're going to change topics and spend a moment talking about a class of usability evaluation methods known as usability inspection or UI methods. The two best known UI methods are the cognitive walkthrough and heuristic evaluation and we will discuss each of them in some detail. UI methods are used for examining user interfaces. These methods don't involve end users or subjects. Rather, they rely on the expert judgment of analysts. They are a cost-effective method and can be used throughout the design cycle. You can even use these methods with design mockups. Before proceeding any further, let's first review Nielsen's very general and broadly applicable usability principles. We've, we have discussed these principles previously. Visibility of system status refers to how easily one can determine the state of the system at any, a given moment in time. For example, if you just clicked on a link on a web page and it's taking a long time to load, you should be able to tell whether the server is slow or overloaded or whether the page is no longer accessible. In most cases, you simply don't know what is going on. Match between system and the real world suggests that the system should speak the user's language using words, phrases, and concepts familiar to the user rather than system-oriented speak. It should also follow real-world conventions. For example, you expect a button to be pressed and a scroll bar to slide up and down to take a very simple case. Minimizing memory load suggests that a user should not have to memorize complex command sequences to use an application. A system that provides multiple clues in texts or icons to guide the user will diminish memory load. When memory load is reduced, a user can de devote more of their energy to the task at hand. 
This is very important when clinicians are interacting with clinical information systems. Their energy should be devoted to tasks and activities that facilitate patient care, rather than having to negotiate the vagaries of a clunky system. Errors are inevitable, but a good system should allow a user to recover from an error without the risk of disastrous consequences such as loss of data. Consistency in standards refers to the fact that a system should adhere to widely acceptable standards and that there should be a measure of consistency across all displays and modules within a given system. Finally, an application that motivates users and is engaging and pleasurable to use will likely be more widely adopted than one that is not. What exactly does the term heuristic mean? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it is, quote, using experience to learn and improve, or involves or serves as an aid to learning, discovery, or problem solving by experimental and especially trial and error methods. With that definition in mind, let's look at heuristic evaluation. It's a method developed by Nielsen and Mullick. It's a relatively popular method and can be learned without too much difficulty. Of course, it takes some experience to refine one's judgment to the expert level. The method provides you with a set of, of principles to note violations of usability principles. The evaluation is independently performed by three to five analysts who can aggregate their scores. In a second pass, analysts rate the severity of problems that they observed from inconsequential to catastrophic. The heuristic evaluation method is applied to one display or screen at a time. This is different from a cognitive walkthrough, which is a task or scenario based. A task typically involves transitions across several screens. In addition, the heuristic evaluation would involve a more comprehensive inspection of elements on the screen. On the other hand, a cognitive walkthrough may ignore screen features that do not impact task performance. There have been several efforts to make Nielsen's heuristic more specific or tailored to a specific context. The heuristics pr proposed by Gerhard Powells is focused on judging a system in terms of how much energy expenditure is necessary to perform a set of tasks. For example, Judgments are made about automating repetitive tasks. Gerhard Powell's also suggested heuristics for grouping items effectively to reduce search and minimizing cognitive load through by aggregating lower level data into summaries. Incidentally, there are several ongoing efforts to introduce summaries to aggregate patient data in electronic health records. This can save unnecessary search time for sifting through different electronic documents, e.g. lab reports, to find the information of interest. This is an example of a heuristic evaluation scoring sheet. P refers to a problem, and S is a proposed solution, which is a, a useful but not essential part of this evaluation process. As displayed in the right-hand column, the analyst notes which heuristic or principle is violated. For example, the analyst noted that the help feature is not sufficiently informative and context sensitive. A proposed solution would be to introduce more in the way of context sensitive guidance. The problem severity scale was developed by Nielsen to be used with the heuristic evaluation, but it is an excellent tool that can be used with any usability evaluation method. Rating the severity of problems is a very important step in usability analysis. The severity is a combination of three factors. One, frequency in with, with which a problem occurs. Two, impact of the problem. And three, problem persistence. Does it quickly go away or is the problem a constant irritant? The rating scale ranges from a cosmetic problem that is not going to be prioritized to a usability catastrophe. The latter needs to be fixed immediately because it could cause clinicians immense frustration. They may have to endure wasted time, and at, its and at its worst, it can compromise patient safety. The National Center for Cognitive Informatics and Decision Making in Healthcare has developed several video tutorials on usability evaluation methods, including three on heuristic evaluation and four on user testing. They can be accessed from the URL dis mentioned in the references. This includes 
This concludes Lecture A of Usability and Human Factors, Usability Evaluation Methods. In summary, we discussed why usability matters in both clinical contexts and health consumers' contexts. We then introduced several usability evaluation methods, including interviews, focus groups, and surveys. We also discussed a widely used in in usability inspection methods, the heuristic evaluation method. What's next? We will introduce a second usability inspection method, the cognitive walkthrough, and then we will discuss the methods associated with usability testing in some detail.